All down. All silent. Going, going, going. Go, solve the red point. Welcome to the Current Market Insights Podcast, brought to you by Harris Partners Real Estate. Each episode, we chat with real estate author and industry leader, Peter O'Malley, to discuss the current property market conditions and provide insights to assist you on your property journey. Hello and welcome to another edition of Current Market Insights. I'm your host, Kieran O'Brien, and as always with me is my good friend, Peter O'Malley. Peter, good afternoon. Hi, Kieran. Good to see you. Good to see you, Peter. Look, I want to have a bit of a chat with you this week. I noticed in the latest uh, Harris Partners Real Estate Report, your monthly newsletter, you've written an article uh, titled Buyer Beware, uh, and you've spoken about in that article some of the common issues that buyers don't necessarily consider when they're looking to buy a property. Uh, And I thought we could chat a bit about that today and get a bit of a sense of what those issues are for our listeners. But I guess starting from the very top, your opening line, you say, you know, buying a property in New South Wales is caveat emptor, buyer beware. Tell us, or tell me, I guess, to help me understand what that actually means for a buyer out there. What it means, Kieran, is that when a purchaser signs the contract, they do so accepting that they have done their full due diligence and besides non-disclosure of certain issues by the vendors, the purchaser has satisfied themselves as per the contract that what they're buying is what they're getting. So as a bit of a recap for, for anyone who may have not listened to some of our earlier additions, what exactly is the due diligence that a buyer would typically do on a property purchase? They would hand the contract of sale across to their conveyancer or their lawyer and their conveyancer or lawyer would ensure that things such as the occupation certificate, building certificate, any renovations, had home warranties, insurance, all of that is compliant. They'd also uh, ensure that uh, what the marketing claims the buyer is buying is reflected in the contract. So as a buyer, whilst you should always keep an eye on that side of things, it really is up to your legal representative just to ensure that um, uh, you are getting what you uh, think you're getting at that point in time. Issues outside the contract, such as the strata report, engineering reports, pest and building inspections, the purchaser can rely on those that are provided by the vendor or they can commission their own, but they don't form part of the contract. So when a purchaser signs the contract of of sale to exchange contracts, they do so accepting that they're buying it in the state that it is, regardless of what those reports say. Okay, so even if a vendor is to commission a, a pest and building report, for example, and it makes some recommendations or some, you know, highlights some things, that necessarily isn't reflected in the contract for the purchaser. They're still going off what's in the document that their conveyancer would have. The written. liability there or the risk if the report is incorrect rests with the the building inspector. That's right. So regardless of who commissions it, the risk is with the building inspector. So the purchaser can't come back and say, I found an issue with the home that was not disclosed in the pest and building inspection. Now I want some form of compensation. It's buyer beware. It was up to the purchaser to satisfy themselves as to the true state of the property and all issues surrounding the property prior to signing that contract. Uh, you also mentioned there that the buyerware also extends to things that the vendor may or may not have disclosed in the process of the sale. Would it not be, well, it's my understanding, would it not be reasonable to expect that the vendor is required to disclose anything they're aware of in the sales campaign? Well, how long is a piece of string and what's an issue for a purchaser that's not an issue for a vendor? So in the article, we talk about some some points there that it's not incumbent on the vendor to disclose, but as a purchaser, you may well want to know about those particular issues. So if there were, we saw um, some high profile cases about 10 years ago of crime scenes, properties, homes that were crime scenes, and then they came to the market inside five years and uh, those crimes weren't disclosed to the purchasers that entered it into the contract. Now, that was deemed as a material fact that the real estate agent should have disclosed in in good and proper duty, and the buyers in that instance, in one of the high-profile cases, was able to rescind the contract. But there's other more nuanced points, which is what the article really talks to. The buyers don't really give primary consideration to when they're buying but once they've moved in it's then that they become a little bit wiser and can I say that the article is not designed to have buyers thinking that there's a perfect property at 
fair market price out there. Uh, buying property in the Sydney real estate market, particularly in the more um, affluent and desirable parts of the city, is all about compromise. What can your budget allow you to buy? But one doesn't want to learn about a major negative to them after they've purchased. So the purpose of the article is to draw attention or illuminate issues that could be an issue for you once you own the property. Well, look, that's a perfect segue, I think, Pete, to kind of step through what's in the article itself. If you're, you're happy, we'll just kind of work through. You've got some good headings here that we can tackle. Uh, the first one you mentioned is seasonal performance. Now, when I think of that in terms of property, I think about what we've said in the past, you know, the, the winter versus spring cycle. Is that what you're referring to in this scenario or is it something a little bit different? No, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. A house that performs well in summer could turn into being a fridge in winter. And a home that has beautiful architect design, glass and steel and allowing brilliant winter sunshine to come in in June, July, you know, could cook you and be a 50, 60 degree house without air conditioning running permanently come summer. So uh, the, the vendors inherently know when their home performs best from a seasonal perspective and if they've got any control over the timing of the sale, they will understandably put the property to market at a point in the, uh, in, the, in the calendar that their home presents best. So if one has a, um, a coldish south-facing uh, house that doesn't have any um, north-facing windows letting light in at the front, that vendor might understandably say this is really pleasant and cool in, in December, but it's, it's far from pleasant and cool in June, uh, being, being winter here in Australia. It's like a fridge, so I'm going to put it on the market in summer. So when you are looking at that property in, uh, in, in December, you need to uh, get some sense of how it might perform or how it might feel in the following winter. Conversely, you might go into a property that's got a lovely fire running on inspection day, but if that fire is not running, what's the performance like of the home? So there's a, a good opportunity there, I think, for buyers to to think a little bit about the you know the role of the sun in in how the the house is presented. Uh, you know we talk about whether it's got a northern aspect or whether it's east facing, whatever it might be. But it sounds like that's a reasonably important thing for buyers to consider, particularly given the the style of houses uh, where we work in the inner west. You know where some of those aspects are cut off by you know the design or whatever it might be. So speaking of cold breezes coming through the house then, uh, your next topic talks about neighbours. We've all heard of NIMBYs. Is, you know, there's something that a potential buyer can do to, to get a bit of a sense of what the neighbourhood's actually like for them before they buy? I think it pays to door knock a few houses around the property that you intend on buying just to get a sense of the area. Neighbours will be fairly forthright about the, uh, about the, the good aspects and the considerations of any particular area. More so in dense living, strata living, I think it really pays to get an understanding of how it runs. There's unfortunately one too many strata plan at the moment that's full of conflict where someone might have a yapping dog or a cat that's jumping fences or this disharmony in the complex. And again, this is not to say that you shouldn't buy a property where that's occurring, but you want to know going into it. And is the dog um, uh, genuinely yapping all day and causing distress to other occupants in the building? Or is it someone who's essentially bullying a neighbour? And I think we've all <clears throat> pragmatically seen both of those instances happen. And that's why, again, it, you'll learn a lot about the property you're considering buying and you'll learn a lot about the location that you're considering buying in if you just door knock on a few uh, few immediate neighbours and ask them their thoughts on the, on, on the building, if it's a strata or a townhouse, or, or on the street if it's a house. Oh, look, I uh, I think that's really solid advice, Peter. I must admit, when uh, when my wife and I were looking to buy a couple of years ago, you gave me some very similar advice, uh, and we spent a fair bit of time after a couple of inspections in the local park nearby uh, and walking around the complex after six or seven at night just to get a sense of how noisy it is. Uh, and in the end, you know, we were able to satisfy ourselves that that it was the right place for us and wasn't going to be too disruptive. Uh, so definitely, uh, definitely something to consider. You mentioned. Fittings within the house, we all know, uh, you know, plenty of builders and architects out there are trying to outdo themselves and each other with how beautiful their house can present once it's renovated. You, you mentioned in particular bespoke fittings. What is it about bespoke fittings in a house that could be a concern for a buyer? Oh, they've got a, a habit of becoming obsolete well within the replacement period. So there are some developments around the inner west that were uh, put together using a magnificent product from Germany, for example. And it's a large development. 
And that development is now at an age where a lot of those fittings and the machinery and the mechanics of it are expiring and they need replacing. And the strata managers stand to reply to, to the owners and the tenants when they, when they want um, things repaired is um, they don't make those parts anymore. Again, um, if you're going for imported uh, products and, and appliances, it's great when they're brand new and they're working. But in five, ten years' time, when the marketplace has evolved and you need to service those appliances, can you still get it done? So how as a buyer can you, I guess, make sure that the fittings are, you know, good quality and that they're of a reputable enough, you know, make that they're still going to be serviceable in 10 or 15 years? Well, globally, we're, and this is only a little point and, and, and I think only 5% of the audience will feel this applies to them, but when you're talking about a global marketplace, Australia is very isolated. So I'm not speaking to the quality of the product or the appliances here, Kieran. I'm talking to the availability of them. Yeah, the long-term serviceability, right? Yeah, so when, when issues start to occur with, um, with, with these uh, German imported appliances or Scandinavian appliances and, and you need to um, get repairs done to them, A, can you get the, the, the parts into the country and um, B, do they even still exist? Yeah, right. Okay. So the, the, the price of getting that beautiful Lieber fridge might be that it takes six months to get a part for it. That's right. No, look, perfectly, uh, perfectly good consideration and, and definitely a uh, one to look out for. Uh, it does go on to another point, a developer's trick as well. And it's one of the topics we've discussed before. Also be aware of uh, what we call cheap build, expensive fittings. And uh, you'll quite often see that developers whose margins are under constant pressure will cut corners in the build, whether that's being, you know, building to basic bare minimum regulations, using cheap products that rust in time. You only really know a cheap build two or three years in, as we've seen in recent times. But the reason the home buyers don't pick it as a cheap build is because when they inspect the property brand new, A, it's never been lived in, so the durability of the property is hard to gauge. And the developer, quite wisely, the investment that they have put into the property has been around the stone bench top and, and the appliances. And then one partner is like, wow, look at this kitchen. I can see myself here. Look at the view out there. And the whole time they're overlooking the fundamental standard of the build is probably not A class. And that's why a lot of the major developers, such as Multiplex, for example, lend lease will always have a good audience when it comes to their product because people know that the build quality and the appliance quality is in sync where when you get down to sort of medium size to smaller developers and one only needs to drive around Sydney to see that that's a cheap build but the buyer probably fell for the expensive stove. Yeah if it's uh, if it looks expensive from the outside and at first glance it uh, can certainly be deceptive. Do you think it's reasonable as a buyer if you're going into a freshly renovated house for inspection uh, to make inquiries about the the materials and the build itself? Is that something that, that is commonly done? Look, anytime you ask someone who's trying to sell you a property a question, if that question's not locked in and captured back into the contract as an ironclad guarantee or undertaking... It means nothing because it's a he said, she said scenario down the track. So what we advise people to do is that if you are buying a brand new build, don't rely on the fact that it's brand new and therefore it must be good. Um, get someone who's independent and in the building industry to come through and give you some sense, whether it's a quality build or whether it's uh, a, a substandard materials and substandard build. When it comes to apartment blocks, I don't know why but issues seem to fall down and sink into the garages. So I always tell home buyers you can tell the quality of a strata title building down in the garage. When you go down into the garage and the taps and the piping is leaking and the electrics are sort of semi-exposed, not live cords, but they're not sort of... It's a bit know, rough. It's a bit rough. The concreting's not as good. You'll often get a very good sense of the quality or not of a strata title building down in the car park. For whatever reasons, issues seem to fall. 
Oh, look, absolutely. I know uh, my car's had a few car washes in the garage of our place, certainly after a big rain. Uh, well, speaking of Strata Title and speaking of uh, buildings that require ongoing maintenance, one of the things that uh, may attract plenty of buyers is uh, what appears to be an attractive Strata levy. You are of the opinion that that could be a bit of a red flag. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you think low Strata levies could be a bit of a catch for, well, for buyers. Well, it's just something that needs to be judged on at merits. So there's so much to consider when you're buying a a property, Kieran, that I just, uh, over my time in real estate anyway, and I'm sure other agents are the same, you see buyers jump to conclusions that are completely incorrect. And one of the things that buyers do jump to the conclusion is this is great, this building's got low strata levies. But low strata levies can mean that the building's underfunded and all that's going to happen to you once you do own that property is you're going to be putting your hand in your pocket by way of special levies to make up for the underinvestment in the property. Conversely, I've seen many buyers write a property off because it's got slightly high strata. But the question is, what is not happening in the low strata levies that should be happening? And what value are you getting out of the apartment with slightly higher strata levies that you don't need to concern yourself with in the future because they're proactive, they're fully financial, if and when issues arise, they can deal with them. So I don't think you should ever screen a property in or screen a property out purely based on the amount of what the strata levies are. You've got to investigate it a little bit deeper. And this is a point that certainly highlights the importance of getting a strata report if you are a buyer or if one's been provided and looking closely at the financial, uh, I guess, health of the the strata and the, the organisation that looks after the building. And understand the practical running of it. Yes. It, 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 strata, strata management is building management. Whilst strata managers, unfortunately for them, are increasingly getting caught up in squabbles between neighbours – which is what you don't want your strata manager investing their time and effort in. A good strata manager is managing the state of the building and making sure it's financed accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. I want to just sort of pivot a little bit now and talk about, let's let's talk about, say, a renovation or a new build somewhere in the inner west. What are some considerations when you're buying the property if someone else near you is developing or maybe looking to develop? Is that something that could impact a purchase for a buyer down the line? Yeah, well, buyers will often, when, when they look at a property, Kieran, they will often look at the development potential of the property that, that it is that they're looking at buying. But we also encourage people, what's the development potential of your neighbour's properties? Because the view or the, the pleasant aspect that you enjoy today could be taken away tomorrow when the, when, when the neighbour puts a, a DA in. Uh, are, you, are you buying an apartment, for example, next to another development site and a high-rise building is going to go in place of the two bungalows next door to you. So it's, it's really important to not just look at the property that you are buying but look at the broader area to say in the years ahead what's likely to happen or what could potentially happen based on zoning and development potential to this precinct. So when you, uh, you pay a premium for that you know, beautiful Harbour Bridge view, not thinking that in two or three years' time someone in front of you may just add a second story and take it away. That's right. And and I think most people buying a property with a Harbour Bridge view would make the effort to work out whether the Harbour Bridge view is at risk or not. But it can be more nuanced than that as well. Um, northern light, sunlight, distance. You, you Again, you may have a, uh, a bungalow next door to you that's set well back from your property, but in time, as we're seeing around the inner west, a developer will get hold of that property, push it over and build a modern architect design McMansion type property on it that's very boxy and they will go right to the edge of what is permissible from a planning perspective and suddenly the bungalow that was five to ten metres from your your window is now a modern monstrosity that you feel like you can reach out your window and touch. Yeah, there's certainly uh, certainly plenty of that around. So if if you are a buyer that's looking at one of these properties, is there actually any inquiries you can make with the council or is there anyone you know in town planning, for example, that you can just make some general conversation with and, and ask the question, hey, given the zoning of this area, is it likely that this could ever happen? Do you think that would work? I would get a local architect to have a look at it and just give you a scan of the area and say, tell me about 
the development potential and opportunities of of this of this area and and the properties that impact on the one I'm considering buying. Yeah, okay. So someone who deals with the local council has done work there before. As we sort of move towards a close, there's a topic I really want to talk to you about uh, that is one of your your headings, thankfully, uh, and that's the issue of parking permits. Now, uh, I've been doing a huge amount of research, as you know, locally into whatever the Inner West Council is doing regarding parking permits. It seems that it is just chaos at the moment. Tell me what you are seeing and what some of your stories are that, that have kind of led us to this point. Well, look, as we've seen, development controls are much looser now than what they were 10, 15 years ago. And we've seen numerous instances, and I think we're going to see numerous more, where a developer pushes over a double-fronted property and puts uh, duplexes on it. And those duplexes don't have parking when they're the finished product because that doesn't meet the FSR, but they are two modern homes. And we've gone from one double-fronted cottage that had parking permit to two duplexes that both need parking permit. When the purchaser buys the property, they mistakenly believe they can go down to the local council and say, I've just bought 4A Darling Street, can I get a parking permit? And the council is saying to people, no, and I've seen letters from council to this degree, no, the other side of the duplex, your twin, is the property that is assigned the parking permit for that lot And because this is now higher density housing than what it was, we are not issuing a parking permit for that property that you've bought, even though you're in a uh, a zone where parking metres uh, apply. And that is changing, absolutely changing the colour of the purchase for the purchaser. But unfortunately, they're learning it all too late. And I won't even accuse the real estate agents of misleading the buyers in that instance because... This issue just kind of popped up out of nowhere earlier in the year and uh, agents got caught with, well, I'd, I've never heard of such a thing. Now, the, the, the letter that I've seen from council highlights that this criteria has been buried in, in council's LEP since uh, 2013, I think it was, but it's only practically being executed now as we're seeing many homes pushed over and multiple dwellings being built on that land in its place. So is there any recourse for these buyers if they find themselves in a scenario where, heaven forbid, buyer beware, they didn't realise or weren't aware that they would not have parking with their purchase? Uh, Do they have any recourse at all in this scenario or are they just kind of out of luck? Kind of out of luck. Um, I think the only place you'd have recourse is if you say, uh, Mr or or, or, or Ms Agent, can, can I get a parking permit for this house? And the agent says, yes, you can. And then you buy that house and then you go down to council and they say, no, you can't have a parking permit for for the property that you've just purchased. Only if you've got a paper trail or a tangible evidence that that the agent gave you the assurance you could get a parking permit, would you have any any sense of uh, recourse against the agent? But there's no winners in that either, of course, because you still own the home. You're not going to be able to get out of that. Yeah. And um, I doubt whether um, if you were still in the contract and you hadn't settled, I still doubt whether you would be able to rescind the contract if, if the agent has misled you like that because you've signed the contract with the vendor. Yeah, certainly uh, a, a scary situation for, for some buyers out there. Uh, look, we've talked about some really, I think, important topics today, Pete. We've sort of covered the gamut of things that are maybe not all that impactful to some buyers. And as we've just discussed right at the end, there's some that could be incredibly impactful. I you know, think it's important, and, and you do as well, that the buyers do take the time, don't rush into these things. It's an expensive proposition buying a house uh, and take the time to ask the questions that are going to impact them in, in each and every transaction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, Peter, as always, been a really great episode, really informative. I appreciate the time uh, that you've taken to come on in and I look forward to talking with you next week. Good on you. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you to everyone for listening to Current Market Insights. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us on the Current Market Insights podcast, brought to you by Harris Partners Real Estate, the podcast providing real estate insights you won't find anywhere else.